Hello, folks. Boy, I'm wound up tonight. I uh, I just listened to a song, and it's got me all wound up. There's power. There's power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. Yeah, there's power in Jesus Christ's blood. And I'm going to share some of that with you tonight. Uh, before we start, you know they wrote the book. I got to put this on there so you can follow it. Uh, the Day His Heart Stopped Crying. It's written by Angela Kennedy, and you can find this on Amazon. But uh, my story isn't so much about the book. It's about Jesus, Jesus Christ. And uh, I am excited tonight. Before we start, I want to share a story with you. Um, last week, a friend of mine, a very nice lady, uh, sent me a message, and it says, uh, uh, can you hear me now? Now, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? I'll put it back in. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, they hear you. Oh, they hear you? Okay, yeah. La last week, a lady, a good friend of mine, sent me a message that said, uh, do you realize that there's a lot of people, this is referring to my Hillcrest days, and she says, do you realize there are a lot of people there that were also poor? And I said to her, and she was right. And I said, yes, I sure do. She was absolutely correct in what she said to me. But the problem is, is that I was so selfish. I didn't realize there was other people hurting just like me. I was concerned about myself, my own feelings, and that's all I was concerned about, not reaching out to other people, not caring if they were hurting or not. And that's just the way it is as we get adults, is that we get going so fast, we're not concerned on if somebody else is hurting. I'm worried about myself, my own depression, my own feelings, and there's other people that have a whole lot worse than me. So I'm sharing these thoughts with you, not so that I had it so bad, but so that you learn from it and so that you don't make the same mistakes I made. I was really, really, really blinded and ignorant. And I made a lot of stupid mistakes. And so I just wanted to, I just wanted to share that with you today, that there's a lot of people out there hurting that have it worse than me. But on the brighter side, on the brighter side, there's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you be free from your guilt and your sin? There's wonderful power in the blood. Now, it's a good thing I'm not a singer, huh? Hey, tonight I got some fun here. I have some, uh, I got some pictures I want to show you uh, so that you get to know me. And this here is a picture right here. Uh, I hope that shows up. Uh, that's a picture of my oldest sister in the middle, my sister Diane over here on the other side, and my sister Ruth in the middle. And that's me on the side. And I used to be really, really cute. But that's our family. I just wanted you to get to know them. And uh, uh, we have a precious family. Born again. So then... Here, as we go, here is another picture. This is when I start maturing into a real man. That's a picture of me as a little kid. I was, uh, let's see, I was, uh, yeah, 12 years old, and I was already getting into trouble. 12 years old. And then as we go, I had, uh, I lived in Germany, and uh, as, after we were married, I lived in Germany. And I'll tell you that story as we go down the road. But then I had my first son, Zachariah John. He was my first son that was born. 
And this is a picture of him and me. And man, was I proud of him, and I still am. Right there. I'm the one with the long hair, and he's the one that's little there. Yeah, yeah. I had to get a haircut there. But anyway, that's that. And then as they grew, here's another picture of uh, my son. And uh, this is a picture of Zachariah and his wife and their four kids. He lives in Denver, Colorado, and he's a born-again man. And his wife is a born-again lady. And you see that little girl right there? Right there? Uh, yeah, that's Abigail. That's my granddaughter, Abigail. They actually went to Hong Kong and got her right from the orphanage. And what a beautiful girl. I'm a blessed man, huh? Yeah. So anyway, now you've seen some of them pictures. But now you know some of my family. And I wanted to have a kind of humorous today because, uh, like I say, that lady that gave me that message, she was right on. She was right on. There's people that had a lot worse than I did. And I thank you for that message, too, sending me that. And at the end, if I don't mess up this uh, uh, technology, we're going to open it up for you to make comments or uh, prayer requests, prayer requests. But I showed you the pictures of the family. And then uh, uh, I made some notes here. So that you could, and I talked to my sister up in Thief River Falls, Minnesota, and we got to laughing on the phone and the way we were brought up. And uh, I got some things here. And as we read them off, if you have any other ideas, send me messages on the way you grew up. Okay. We grew up, my dad was a born again minister. He was really on fire. He was an evangelist. Everything is forgiveness. Everything is salvation. Jesus' blood. That's what he preached on. But anyway, some of the things we were allowed to do and not to do. <laughs> this ought to be good, huh? Um, now, some of these you won't understand because we're talking back in the 60s. Uh, we were Because uh, my dad was a minister, we were never allowed to go bowling. Oh, that was sinful. That was sinful. So uh, the church people put that on him. And he says to us one day, us kids, he says, you know what? I really don't care if you go bowling, but I can't allow you to. The church doesn't want me to. So he was in submission to the church leadership. So we never went bowling. And I never bowled. I don't think I, don't think I bowled until I was, I don't know, probably 18 years old. Uh, dances. <laughs> Dances were strictly taboo. We never went to dances. I've never been to a public dance to this day. That was something we just weren't allowed to do at all. Uh, movies, I told you earlier, we were not allowed to go to movies. That was sinful. And uh, the first time I went to a movie was when I was uh, in Waterloo, Iowa. That Dean Martin movie I told you about. Uh, do you like a good game of cards? I was never allowed to play cards. Uh, that was sinful. And to this day, I don't even know how to play cards. Uh, they say there's, a, there's an ace of spades and a jack of something and a king of something and a queen. I don't even know what that means. But no way could I play cards. Uh, do you know what a game of carom is? Carom is a square board about like this. And it has pockets in each corner. It has little discs in the middle. And you take a stick and you hit them in. But my dad, we could play it, but we were not allowed to use a stick. Oh, no. No, you can't use a stick. So we were allowed to play the game, but I had to take it and I had to snap it with my finger. And if we, we had a carom game in our school, and they would get that game out. And everybody else, they'd use a stick, and I'm standing there snapping it with my finger. So uh, that was another one. Uh, did I ever tell you about my first experience smoking? Now, smoking and chewing, that was strictly taboo. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was in Toronto, South Dakota, and my buddy, we decided we were going to learn how to smoke. And so 
we went and we stole a pack of cigarettes. Winston. Winston tastes good like a cigarette should. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so we stole this pack of cigarettes. We went over to the city park, went into the outhouse. It's a two-holer. And so he sat over on one side and I sat on the other. And we started smoking and puffing. Well, the smoke couldn't go anywhere except in our eyes. And we just uh, puffed away and puffed away until tears were running down our face. And we couldn't see anything in there. And finally, we took the cigarettes and said, this is no good. And we threw them down into the two-holder there. And we charged out the door just gasping for air. That was my experience smoking. Yeah, I decided that's no good. That's no good. Um, oh, oh, my sisters and I, we were laughing today. Uh, jewelry. As we grew up, my sisters were never allowed to wear any jewelry. Everything had to be very plain. No jewelry, uh, no earrings, and uh, pierced ears were strictly outlawed. In fact, we have a humorous story about my mother. Uh, she wanted pierced ears, but dad says, absolutely not. And so when my dad passed away, <laughs> the first thing my mother done is she went downtown and got her ears pierced. She got the final say on that. <laughs> yeah, these are true. Uh, long dresses. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. My sisters had to wear long dresses and uh, never slacks or jeans to church, strictly out. Is any of this reflecting or, or is, is it bringing back memories from you on what you grew up having to, having to do and learn? Okay. Uh, shorts. Now, my sisters, I've never seen my sisters in a pair of shorts, ever. They were not allowed to wear shorts whatsoever. No, no. Finally, one day, my sister uh, uh, went to school, and the other students, they knew about how conservative we were growing up. And the, the boy ahead of my sister, Diane, he turns around and he says, Hey, do you guys even believe in a pop-up toaster? <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah. So we believed in the pop-up toaster. Oh, yeah. And we believe in the blood of Jesus Christ, too. And <laughs> so that's some of the, um, one of the greatest things I ever had as a young kid. Um, in white South Dakota, they had a basketball tournament. And I, I of course, I played basketball. And uh, the one award that I won out of all the tournament, at the end, when they were passing out trophies, now we didn't come in first place. I don't know what place we came in, but when we were, they were, everybody went up to stand on the uh, platform and get their trophies. And when they did, they said, we have a trophy, uh, a plaque for a medal for the best sportsman in the whole tournament. And everybody's sitting there waiting. And they said, Steve Fry from Toronto. And everybody jumped up and started cheering. And I went up and got that. And when I got home that night, my dad came up and he says, Steve, I would rather have you get that trophy than the first place trophy. And that meant a lot. And I kept that medallion. I kept it until just probably six months ago. And I passed it on to my daughter. I got a trophy or a medallion for sportsmen. And my dad was so proud of me for that. Um, I got a couple more here that... Uh, that, um, okay, one last one here is uh, <clears throat> every day, every night at 6 o'clock, supper time, we had to be at the table and we had our assigned seats. And uh, so we go down there and sit down. And before we could pass out any food, we had to say a prayer. Mandatory. I can never remember sitting down to a meal without praying. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest. Let these gifts to us be blessed. Amen. Then my dad would say, okay, mama, let's pass the food. Well, <clears throat> one day we sat down there, and the only time I ever remember us eating without praying is that I would sit on one side, and my sister's on the other, and the sister beside me, my dad at the head of the table, and my mother over here at the other end. And as we said, come, Lord Jesus, I looked up with one eye like this. And I go to my sisters and go, well, while we're praying, <laughs> she 
she starts giggling. And we're all giggling. My dad says, all right, knock it off. He says, start it over. So we said, come, Lord Jesus, be our guest. <laughs> we start giggling again. <laughs> he says, all right, I'm going to give you one more chance. He says, now you start praying and you say the prayer decent. Let's go. So, come Lord Jesus, be our guest. And all of us were giggling. <laughs> yeah, I guess I can't pray. My dad takes his hand and he slams it down on the table. He says, all right. He says, fold your head and bow your hands. When he said that, we all burst out laughing, including my mother. And we're, oh, and so we're over trying to, trying to fold our head and bow our hands, you know. And he says, all right, we'll eat, but nobody leaves the table until we say a very nice prayer. And thank you, Jesus, for this. And that's the only time that I ever remember, uh, ever remember starting to eat without praying. So anyway, Sundays, that was another special day, folks. Uh, we got up. Uh, I had made some notes here. Uh, we went to Sunday school. Absolutely. I can never, ever, ever remember missing Sunday school. And then I used to, used to get a pin hung here with all these little bars on it for perfect attendance. Uh, then uh, that was at, uh, say, 10 o'clock. And then at 11, we had church. Then we went home and everybody was required to sit around the table. Sunday dinner was almost religious. We were on a, required to sit around there. And then um, we had church that night at seven o'clock. But Sunday afternoon, a lot of times we had a gospel evangelist come in and he had a message from two o'clock till four o'clock. So if you can imagine on a nice hot day in South Dakota, when you don't have air conditioning and you're sitting there trying to, you know, trying to, to at, from two to four, trying to stay awake. Oh, and my, my buddy and I, we'd play games during there. So nobody would catch on. Uh, we had a uh, Ole Barnes that come through there and he always, he always gave the message, and he had saying, and Jesus can save to the uttermost. And that's just the way it's said. Save to the uttermost. So Gary and I, we got to laughing in a back row there, and we'd count how many times he'd say, Jesus can save to the uttermost. And he'd get up in the 30 times in one message. And then, of course, then we had to have church on Wednesday nights, too. Wednesday nights, absolutely. You do not miss. And uh, Sunday afternoons, uh, when we didn't have a guest speaker, we had to be quiet. Dad was whipped. And my mother was too. They worked hard. And so they'd go in the bedroom and they'd take a nap. And we were required to be very, very quiet and so that they could enjoy their nap. But uh, 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 oh, the last thing I want to tell you is that when I was about 13 years old, my dad had a 1963 Plymouth, and that had a manual transmission, not automatic. So I thought, well, I'll be nice. I'm going to go out. It was in the garage there. I'm going to start that for him so it warms up. So my sister and I, we go in there, and we jump in, and I turn the key to start it. It was a manual transmission. I didn't know how to work the clutch. And it takes off and wing it. It rams right into the, into the garage door. My dad comes running out. And you know what? He didn't get mad. I said, Dad, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was just trying to start the car so it was warm when you come out. It's okay. So he got in there and showed me what I had to do. He taught me. But that's that's just some of the memories. You think it's all bad. No, it wasn't all bad, but I sure made a lot of mistakes, a lot of mistakes. Well, anyway, go, moving on back to what I'd left you with in, uh, in uh, uh, 
I, what I left you in last uh, couple nights ago, uh, I went over to Germany, and that's where I learned the first aspect of drinking. We went down to the local Gasthaus, and uh, they would come out with a glass boot, cowboy boot, about this big around, about this tall, and they'd fill it full of beer. And then they'd put it at the head of the table, and the guy would take a drip, uh, uh, drink, and then he'd pass it to the next guy. And it went around, and everybody would plan on it because whoever had the last drop took the last drop the next guy had to buy. So it was a game. And also, as you were drinking, you had to tip the boot so the toe was pointing up so that when the beer went up there, eventually, when it came all out of the toe, it would go whoosh, it would splash and hit the guy in the face. Well, that was my first experience at drinking. And uh, then uh, I did get married while I was over there. And uh, she joined me. And I'd done a lot of traveling. I made some notes here. I went to Austria. I camped out in Interlaken, Switzerland, right in the Alps for eight days there. Went to France and Holland. I went to East and West Berlin, East and West Germany. And one of the times when I went to, uh, we traveled to a place called Dachau. And uh, that's where they had the concentration camps. And uh, I went in there. And they had the bodies piled as high as the ceiling here and pictures of it, you know. And <clears throat> that was in 69. Uh, so it wasn't very long after the Second World War was over. I mean, there was still tensions. But I remember looking at them bodies, legs sticking out, and it stuck with me all these years. I mean, thousands of bodies. And I thought, Jesus. You knew every one of them bodies. He loved every single one of them. Yeah. And I, I walked into the ovens there where they baked the Jews. And I got to walk through there and stick my head right into the ovens. And I thought, oh, how inhumane. That's terrible. But that stuck with me for many, many years. And that's where my... Uh, First son, Zachariah, he was born over in Germany, and he was born in a midwife, not in a hospital, uh, just with a midwife. <clears throat> anyway, uh, my wife, we took her into this la lady, and she took her upstairs, and uh, she came out with a stick about this long, and it looked like a trombone on each end, and then narrows down. And she put that on there, and listen to the heartbeat with that stick. And that's where Zechariah John, my oldest boy, was born. So that was a very memorable time. And I went back. We traveled there a lot. We bought all kinds of antiques, uh, wax candles, everything you could think of, cuckoo clocks. Brought all that back. And that was part of my life. But <clears throat> when I was over there, like I told you, I was making a lot of money illegally and I wasn't living godly life but I wanted to get you so you're, you're grinning and thinking how wonderful life is uh, I went back to West Union and that's where I had a nice little acreage out on the Turkey River and I built a beautiful beautiful log home and uh, a beautiful log home and uh, fireplace, everything, 20 acres there. And uh, that is where I am going to take off and tell you about next time. Because I fell into sin, and I don't, it was my fault. I was sinful. I was wrong. And I accept that responsibility. And I've had to accept that discipline from Jesus Christ. Jesus disciplined me, but he also, when I fell on my knees, he forgave me, and he gave me a new life, a new life, and that's where I'm going to be talking to you about. I brought a picture of this here. I want to show you this, and you're going to say, well, what's that about? 
look at down in there. Now this is only, this here is only two inches. This is only two inches high. Now this was totally, totally dead. It done this the last three years now. Totally dead. Nothing in there except this here black thing uh, right here. This black thing, this black base here. And I kept throwing water on it, throwing water on it. And pretty soon, this week, it started out. Now, next week, I'm going to bring it back and have you see again. Because pretty soon, it'll grow up, and it's going to have a beautiful blossom on it. And you know why that's important to me? I got to looking at that this morning. And I says, that's it. That's my life. I was rotten and dead in my sins. And Jesus kept putting water on my life. He kept calling me. And now it is just starting to sprout. Jesus calls us. It's just starting to sprout a little bit. And the more water that I drink from Jesus, the bigger it grows. And pretty soon it'll be this high with a beautiful blossom on there. And I'm going to show you that. That's the same way with my life. I was dead in my sins. Filthy. Jesus kept giving me water. He followed me all the way through. And then he says, Steve, come on to me. I love you. I came to Jesus. I'm not, my life isn't great, historical, full of blossoms yet. But if I follow Jesus Christ, it will be. And maybe somebody will be able to see that blossom. And that's what I'm trying to bring to you today. It's about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And I saw it came to me just before I came out here. It's wonderful that Jesus saved me. It's wonderful that he forgave me. It's wonderful, wonderful, so very wonderful that he is mine. And I pray that he's yours. And I hope you got something out of what I shared with you tonight. I got a verse I want to leave with you here. And uh, uh, yeah, yeah, here it is in uh, Matthew. It's when Jesus was in a ship and he passed over and came unto his own city. And, they be and behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. <laughs> and Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? For whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise up and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. And then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go unto thine house. And he arose and departed to his house. But Jesus has the power. He has the power to forgive. He has the power to cure. He has the power to create everything, to do everything. And I always say, one of these days, he's going to come back through the clouds with the trumpet sounding, and he's, I'm going to fall on my face, and I'm going to say, Jesus, Jesus, forgive me. Remember me. I want to be found faithful. And that's what I pray that each of you do, that you remember this this flower, and that next week your life has grown from here up to here. Your faith has grown from here up to here with the water from Jesus Christ. I'm getting too excited. I get excited when I share with you people. I will pray one time here with you, please, folks. Please let me pray with you. Oh, Lord Jesus, I pray tonight that you would reach out and touch each one of these people that are listening that they would know the power you have to save and forgive and to heal and to cure, and that you're coming back. And Jesus, I'm going to be faithful till the day I die, Lord Jesus. And I ask that each of my friends would be too. Praise you in your name, Jesus. Amen. Are there any questions at all? 
If you have any prayer requests that you want to live with, leave. You just leave that on here. I will get that, and I will pray for that earnestly until we talk again. But next time when I talk, it would be emotional. Now that you know me better, it'll be. It, I will talk to you, and I'll tell you about how I lost everything because of my sin. It was my fault, my sin. And I had to get on my knees and how Jesus restored it all back to me. Uh, what's that? The chat's right here on the right. You can see what people are telling you. I can't see good, folks, so I have to have my wife here help me. Oh, yes. John Kelly. I got it lined up so that here's a dear friend of mine that I told you about. That was dead in his sins, married four times, an alcoholic, laid on the bathroom bleeding. Jesus reached down and saved John, and I was scared to death when I had to go talk to him. I thought he's going to hit me right in the nose. But John received it. He received Jesus Christ as his personal Savior, and he's a born-again Christian. He's been faithful several years now. Yeah. Uh, who else was on there, Marie? I can't read that, Marie. Danny. Dan oh, yes, Danny, my friend Danny. He's a brother from down in Chillicothe. Oh, I praise the Lord for Danny. And John Kelly and Danny are both going to be on here as guests someday. And Danny is a born-again believer. He sings songs on, on that Backyard Chicken every once in a while. He's on fire for Jesus Christ. If it wasn't for Jesus, I wouldn't have these friends. If it wasn't for Jesus, we would have nothing to sing about or rejoice about. And I greet each of you brothers in Jesus' name. And I thank Jesus for you. God bless you. Now, just because I end the stream here, you can always send me messages. You can message me anytime, and I will pray for you. But pray that I can get John Kelly and Danny on here to give their testimony. God bless you. Amen. How'd it go tonight?